Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you. Uh, welcome to the broadcast. Uh, tonight, tonight, I have something that I need to share with all of you. You'll notice the question that I put up. It says, is the Bible enough? Is the Bible enough? It, that is a question that all of us need to consider, all of us who profess to be Christians. And even those who don't profess to be Christians, who may become Christians at some point, is the Bible enough for us? Or do we need to seek revelation somewhere else? Do we need to look elsewhere for truth? Here's the situation that, that's been troubling me for a while. And so this is, this is not so much a sermon tonight, I don't think, as just really a, uh, a heartfelt message. Because it troubles me what I'm seeing and hearing across the, the, the depth and width of Christianity, of what's called Christianity. I believe we are living in the last days, but then again, the last days really are not a particular uh, set of years here where each time a generation comes along and says, oh, we're living in the last days. No, the last days started when Christ went back to heaven. All of the New Testament era is the last days because it's the last days of the survival of this earth in its present condition. So all of it, from the time that Jesus went back to earth in Acts chapter 1, until he comes back again, are the last days. Don't let someone say, well, it's just uh, this particular time are the last days. We're living in the last times. It has been happening ever since the apostles watched Jesus go back into heaven. And we've been awaiting his return for over 2,000 years. So we are in the end times or the last days. Now, I just wanted to clear that one up and get that out of the way first. Let's talk about this magnificent book here, okay? This book is the Bible. And I believe that it is the inerrant, unfailing, eternal Word of God. There are 66 books in the Bible. It starts at Genesis, ends at Revelation. And all of everything that's contained within it, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, verse 21, is the Word of God. Now... Let me try to put things in perspective. Of all the millions or billions of people who have ever lived and the billions and billions of conversations that have taken place and incidents that have happened around the world, God selected these to put into his book. The word Bible means book, the Bible, the book. And while there are 66 books contained in here written by different people like Isaiah and Jeremiah, it is one book. It is one book. You cannot go into a bookstore or go online or go to anywhere where you can buy the Bible volume two. There is no sequel. This contains everything that God wanted us to know as human beings. It tells us in Genesis how the world began, how everything came into being, how God created everything, how man fell into sin. It also tells us throughout the Bible why the world is in the condition that it's in. It tells us all about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to redeem mankind for all those people who would believe on him so that he could give them eternal life and give them forgiveness of sins. And it's the only book that tells us exactly, precisely how everything is going to end. And we read that in Revelation. And at the end, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth that God is going to rebuild, where all of the, the evil, all of the unbelievers... Everything will be gone, and it will return to that bliss and peacefulness that was way back in the beginning. And so we have a complete story. There's no need to go somewhere else. Now, some of the things I, I may say may upset some people or be controversial, and guess what? I'm used to that. I'm used to that. I'm just trying to share with you as honestly as I can right from Scripture. If you know anything about this ministry and this preacher— this pastor here, you never hear me bring in uh, a theologian's point of view. You never hear me talk about theologians or some other preacher. Oh, I'll mention that there are false preachers and false prophets out there, and I do have a biblical uh, precedent where I could name names. But I'm not quite there yet. I just think you get into all kinds of, you start throwing around names. I say that the Bible says, by the fruit you will know them. And if you know the Bible, 
you will start recognizing who is and who is not a false prophet. You'll know them because you'll know them by their fruit, what they say, who follows them, uh, the kind of stuff that they're spewing. A lot of it is not biblical. And so the burden on my heart has, it's been all day, all day I have felt this. Is the Bible enough? And for me, the Bible is enough. When God says at the end of Revelation, he says, do not add to the words of the prophecy of this book. You read it in Revelation 22, verse 17 and 18. If you're keeping notes or you're writing things down. Revelation 22, verses 17 and 18 says, do not add to the words of the prophecy of this book. And also do not take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, some people make the mistake and say, well, that just means the book of Revelation. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And I'm going to show you, and we did this before in a previous study. And it, you know what? It bears repeating again for those of you who didn't see or hear that study. That is not the only place in the Bible where God says, write things down in a book, a book, a singular book. It starts in Deuteronomy. Here's a reference. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2 says this, when God was telling this to Moses, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. That was in Deuteronomy, Old Testament. Just in case you think that God was only talking about the book of Revelation, about not adding and subtracting. If we go over to Deuteronomy 12, there's something very similar mentioned there by God once again. Here it is in Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. He says, whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add nor take away from it. So God is telling us, whatever I'm commanding you to do, don't add to it, don't take away from it. What is he commanding? His commandments, his book, his word. We're to believe in the Bible. We're to believe that this is his holy word. We're not to add to it. We're not to take away from it. It's as simple as that. And then when we get to Revelation 22, and you know what? Let me go to Proverbs 30 first. If you have your Bible, I know we're jumping around a little bit, but there's a lot to cover here. Proverbs 30, God says something very interesting here. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, listen. It says, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Verse 6, do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. Now, that fits in with when we, when we see passages like Deuteronomy 18 and Matthew 24 that talk about false Christ and false prophets. You read Deuteronomy 18 and it talks about a false prophet. What is a false prophet? And believe me, there's a lot of false prophets running around today. A lot. More than I've ever seen before. There's always been false prophets. You could read about them in scripture. They're in there. I, I think of one, Simon the sorcerer was one. He tried to buy the gifts that the apostles had. I think you read that in Acts. It's in Acts. He tried to buy his way in. And they're like, no, 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 that's not happening. He was false. He was somebody false that was thrown in front of the apostles. I believe it was a test for them. But when we see things here, when, when things are said that are not biblical, that have no biblical validation, and you can't back them up, then you have what's considered a false prophet. You have a false teacher. You have someone that the Bible right here says can be proved a liar. The Bible says, let every man be a liar, but let God be true. And you know, those of you who, who watch me or listen to me all the time, what do I always say? Be a Berean. I, I have to tell you this. You must be a Berean. And yes, we're jumping around a lot, but you can go back and watch this broadcast a few times if, if I'm going too quick for you. But you know what? I've talked about the Bereans before. I want you to hear exactly. There's only three verses that talk about those people who lived in Berea, okay? It's in Acts 17, verses 10, 11, and 12. Listen to this. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. There was no hesitation. As soon as Paul and Silas got into town, into Berea, they went right into the synagogue and started preaching. Verse 11. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Greek, another word for that, is also known as the Gentiles. The Bible calls them Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, those that were not from Israel. 
So what happened? They received the word with all readiness. They had open minds, open hearts, open eyes. They were ready to receive the word. They were listening to what Paul and Silas were telling them. But even as great as Paul was as a preacher, and I'm sure Silas was as well, they did not accept that just as truth. They didn't just say, wow, that was a powerful sermon. I'm just going to accept it the way it is. No. They went to the scriptures daily. What are the scriptures that they're talking about? It was the Old Testament. Ah, you mean that there's something worthwhile in the Old Testament to study and to look at? Yes. There are some people that just... I don't know. Have you ever gone into a bookstore or you maybe you have something at home where you have a Bible that's just the New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs? Have you ever seen that? I used to have a couple of those. I got rid of them. You know why? Because it's not the whole Bible. The Bible is all 66 books. It's not the New Testament plus Psalms and Proverbs. That, that never made sense to me. Why would you take God's word and just divvy it up? Why would you change that? Why would you do anything to change God's word? It doesn't make sense. And I was not going to have any part of it. So those things, when I came across one or I had found one in my possession, out it went. I did not use it, nor did I give it to anyone else. Because I, when I used to do Bible, uh, give out ministry, oh, that's a terrible phrase. I used to give away Bibles for free. As, as God blessed me with money, I would take Bibles and I would give them out free. Whoever needed one. But they got a complete Bible. They didn't get a New Testament only, or they didn't get a New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs. That is, that, that is ridiculous. That is not the Bible. The Bible is all 66 books. And here's what, the, here's what the Bereans did, okay? Here's what the Bereans did. Let me see what's, yeah. Good, awesome, praise God. It is a wonderful ministry. And you never know who's going to read that Bible and who is going to respond to that and become a Christian. But here, here's what I'm saying. In going back to this question that's been plaguing me all day long, is the Bible enough for us? And the, the answer we must come to is an emphatic yes. The Bible is enough because it's all that God gave us. He gave us what he wanted us to know. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I've been a Christian for over 30 years, and I don't understand God. I accept him for who he is. But much of what God is, is a divine mystery. I can't explain God. I can explain God as far as the Bible tells me. But what I was showing you here with the Bereans here in Acts 17, 11, here's what I'm showing you. They received the word with all readiness of heart. They were eager. They wanted to hear the word. But they didn't just stop there. They went and they checked out the scriptures, in which case was the Old Testament. They checked out the scriptures to make sure that what they were hearing was the truth. And those of you who watch me or, or listen to me or follow my post or whatever, you know that I'm always saying this. You must be a Berean. If you hear nothing else from me tonight, hear this. Be a Berean. You must search the scriptures to make sure that what you're hearing is true. Because especially in this time, there are, I see them and I hear them all the time. They're there are false prophets everywhere, and they are proliferating. They are all over the place, more so than ever before. And I think a big part of that is because of social media. All of a sudden, you know, and I, everybody and his brother is suddenly an apostle. Uh, we have self-appointed bishops. Where are they coming from? I, I, I saw somebody not long ago who called himself not just an apostle, he was a chief apostle. What does that mean? That's not even in scripture. There is no such office. It's not there. It doesn't exist. So I look at someone who calls themselves a chief apostle, and they have apparently other apostles under them, or they have a bishop, or however they're setting this up. And I'm looking at this, and I'm, and I'm saying, where are they getting this? It's not coming from scripture. It's not there. It's not coming from the Bible. Now, you may be upset. You may be following someone, or you may know someone who's one of these apostles or chief apostles. And there are some people that do believe in what's known as the fivefold ministry that we read about, where there are still apostles and there's still pastors and teachers and so on and so on. But I, I challenge you to do this. Here's what I challenge you to do. Is the Bible enough? Yes, the Bible is enough. The Bible should be enough. Let me ask you a question. How well do you think you know the Bible? How well? Have you ever read the Bible all the way through? All 66 books. I'm not talking about necessarily in order. Have you ever read the whole Bible? And how much of the Bible do you think you really know? 
you know, I, I've been I've been studying the Bible for over 30 years, and I don't know it all. I would never presume to even under, to even tell you that I know it all or even understand it all. We could study the Bible for 5,000 years and not get all of this. And so is the Bible enough for us to study each and every day? If you want to find out about God, if you want to know who God is, if you want to know what God's plan is for your life and what God has in mind, where are you going to find it? From the lips of men? No, you're going to find it right here in the pages of Scripture. Scripture, the Bible. And just in case you think that the Bible is an archaic book, that it's old-fashioned, that it was written thousands of years ago and it has no application to today's world. Just in case you happen to think that, you are wrong. Because people are still reading this book, people are still hearing the words of this book, and they're still getting saved. Romans tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if this was a dead, archaic book that had no bearing on today's life, no one would be getting saved. There would be no new believers. There'd be no new pastors raised up or evangelists. There'd be no new missionaries raised up. There wouldn't be people dying every day around the world for this book. So really, it's an archaic book? No. You want to be in denial, that's fine. That's between you and God. You'll answer for that. But this book is just as relevant today. Pick any subject you want. And even if the Bible doesn't address it specifically, there is some kind of general guideline in here that we can follow. And some of the, you know, hot topic issues, I stay away from politics. I don't talk about politics. I'm not involved in politics. Not something that interests me anymore. I pulled away from that corrupt system many, many years ago. But you talk about some of the hot topics, you know. You could talk about homosexuality or lesbianism. That's a big thing these days. Well, the Bible discusses that both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And everywhere you look, it's an abomination to God. It's not correct. It's not the way God set things up. Whether you like it or not, it's still God's word. You can accept it or you can reject it. God says that there's a place called hell that he never intended men to go, but there will be people there because there are people who have left this world and rejected Jesus Christ. And when you do that and when you leave this world without Jesus and you're not, you're not your Lord and Savior, guess what? Your sins are not paid for. You're, you're you're not covered in the blood of Jesus, and you cannot get into heaven. That's not Thomas saying that. That's the Bible says that. If you read the Bible, you'll find out what God says. There's a certain way he wants us to live. There's a certain way he does it. He calls us to holiness. He calls us to a life of righteousness. He calls us to a life of obedience. Now, we have a choice. You can obey God, and you can live righteous. And you can live a holy life to the very best of your ability. And when we fall, when we sin, we seek repentance, we receive it, we keep going. Or you can reject the whole kit and caboodle. You can get rid of all of it and say, the Bible is fairy tales. I don't believe in a God that would send people to hell, blah, 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 blah. And I've heard all the excuses. Because guess what? I was one. I was one of them at one time. I made excuses too. I didn't need Jesus. I didn't need a savior. I was a good person. I wasn't a robber. I didn't ever murder anyone. I didn't rape anyone. I'm a good person. I'm going to heaven. No, I wasn't. I know now where I'm going. So the question is, is the Bible enough for us? Yes, it's enough for us. It better be enough for us. And I challenge you that if you don't read the Bible regularly, start reading it every day, more than once a day if you're able to. I mean, those of us who are called into the ministry and, and the pastorhood and so on, we study for hours a day because we have to prepare sermons and messages, and that's what God has called us to do. And we need to bring messages. If we're being honest with ourselves and we're being honest with those we shepherd, we need to bring the whole counsel of God, all of it, Acts says. Don't just pick and choose. We can't just cherry pick the nice parts of the Bible and leave out the rest of it. I want to show you just how important scripture is and when you see the word scripture they're talking about the bible not outside the bible if you go with me to at the end of luke do you remember the two men that were on the road to emmaus we read about that in luke let me find it here luke 24 now i'll just give you the the, the story basically these were two men are walking on emmaus jesus had already been crucified and they, they walked away dejected, and they were discussing those things that recently had happened in Jerusalem. Suddenly, they find a man that's walking with them. They don't know it's Jesus just yet. I want to give you some of the dialogue here. 
It says, two of them, this is uh, Luke 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And Jesus starts having a dialogue with them. Tell me what's going on. What, what were you talking about? And they say in verse 18, are you the only one that was visiting Jerusalem and you're unaware of everything that happened? And Jesus asked in verse 19, he says, what things? What happened? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word and in the sight of all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to sentence to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he was going to redeem Israel. Remember, the people were looking to have someone take them out of the yoke of bondage away from the Romans. And they wanted to make Jesus king so that he would start a revolution and he would deliver the Jewish people out of the clutches of the Romans. Jesus, of course, said that's not what his kingdom was for. It's not what he came here for. And obviously he didn't do that. But what's interesting is that once he opens their eyes, it says here... It says here that he opened he opened their eyes because they did not recognize it was Jesus, okay? Now, it says here after he opened their eyes in verse 27, it says, Beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself, himself, Jesus, in all of the scriptures. In all of the scriptures. All of them. That's all the Old Testament. That also proves, once again, that just like the Bereans, Jesus was teaching these two men from Moses and the prophets. Moses are the first five books of the Bible. The prophets are the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs and the Ezekiels and so on. And all the writings, the Old Testament, he told them about himself. Jesus opened their eyes to every prophecy that was in the Old Testament concerning him. So you think the Old Testament maybe is irrelevant? It's not. It's just as important as the New Testament. So is the Bible enough? You go, yeah. Yeah. But the whole Bible must be enough. Genesis to Revelation. You can't take parts, bits and pieces and decide to do what you want with it. You can't separate it. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you're writing down or you're flipping in your pages of the Bible, you're getting some finger exercise tonight here, aren't you? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's move over here. You know these verses here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or the woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Wow. All scripture. Now we have a completed Bible. Genesis through Revelation. All scripture. All. You hearing the word all? Hello. Are you hearing the word all? Doesn't mean pick and choose what you want. It doesn't mean get up in the pulpit every Sunday and just teach fluffy little feel-good messages. They have no conviction, no deliverance, no repentance, no questioning of sin, no redemptive quality, nothing. It also means you don't get up in a pulpit and you start preaching nonsense that has nothing to do with the Bible either. And there are many preachers out there with these false gospels that are out there telling you things that just aren't true. There's only one way to determine if something is true or not. Read it, study it, be a Berean. I cannot stress that enough. Because I know the Bible fairly well, I can tell almost immediately if someone is preaching something false, if someone is teaching something that is not biblical. Because I understand the basics of the Bible, I understand the basics of salvation. I have a grip of all the basics a lot of smaller details, too, that are like obscure passages and all. But when you understand the gospel message, you understand the gospel that Jesus preached. Jesus preached. And you understand what it means to be a true born-again believer and to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and have the gift of eternal life and understand that it is a gift from God. It's not a works gospel. And when you start realizing, when people start taking scriptures out of context, and I did a whole series of Monday Night Manners on this topic, where we looked at various uh, verses and passages that are taken completely out of context. So that what happens is, when you do that, you can make up your own gospel. You can make up your own doctrine. And you can call the gospel whatever you want. Well, let's, let me tell you this. There is no prosperity gospel, okay? 
Some of you may watch and you may turn me off right now or block me or whatever. There is no such thing as the prosperity gospel. It is not there. It is not in the Bible. You know how you get the prosperity gospel? By taking a handful of cherry-picked verses, twisting their meaning, and then getting them to say something that God never intended them to say. That's how you get it. You want to fleece the people a lot? Preach prosperity. Preach prosperity. You'll get, you'll get your share of money in, and you'll get your share of followers because it seems to be one of the hot gospels out there. But it's a phony gospel. Yes, I'm saying it. It's a false gospel. It doesn't exist. There's only one gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what he preached. And he said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I am the Father are one. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, to me, except the Father draw him. Jesus said, you, there's no eternal life outside of him. Jesus is the bridge. He is the conduit between sinful man and almighty righteous God. And if you don't have that bridge, okay, if you do not have that bridge, then you don't have salvation. You're not a true believer. You don't have repentance for your sin. None of that. If you get caught up in one of these cults, if you get caught up in a false gospel, you may be led to believe that what you're hearing is the truth. And if you don't study the Bible for yourself, and I'm not, I'm not saying, folks, that you have to be a scholar. I am not saying that you need to go to seminary and get degrees like many of us have. You don't have to do that. But you do have to read, and you do have to question, and you do have to wonder. Even this message tonight, I encourage you, take every scripture I gave you and go back and look at it in light of the whole Bible and make sure that what I'm saying to you is the truth. If you're caught up in one of these cults, and believe me, they're out there, then I, I'm praying for you that you break away from these cults. Now, I'm not talking about the blatant cults that has the Bible plus something else. For instance, the, the Mormons, a cult. They have the Bible, and they have something called the Book of Mormon. They hold the Book of Mormon up as equal, if not more important, than the Bible. Immediately, you know that's a false prophet uh, teaching that. It's a it's a cult. No one any part of that. You so there there is a, a case right there. But there's a lot of them. There's quite a few of them, and it's multiplying all the time. The Bible tells us we're supposed to be in unity. We're supposed to have unity, and yet there are thousands of denominations. And each time somebody gets upset at something, or stops their foot, or finds another writing they want to add to it. They, they run off and start something else. The Christian science people, it's another one. Yes, I'm, I'm naming them too. They have, the, they have this keys to the scripture book or something. They're talking about Christian science. If you read that book, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It's all manipulated. It's all twisted. Same with the prosperity gospel. So I'm asking this question a lot tonight because you need to consider it the same way. I've already considered it. Is the Bible enough? Is it enough? You could spend the rest of your life reading the Bible every single day and you won't understand all of it. So don't you think that if God wrote one book, and he did, he wrote a book right here, it's the Bible. He wrote one book. Don't you think that if you're a true believer, if you really want to know about God, you want to understand the Lord and Savior, and you want to understand eternal life and salvation and all these things, you want to read about what God said happened in history, not what man says, what God says. Don't you think you should be reading the Bible? There's plenty of other books out there we can waste our time with. And listen, I am not saying that there aren't some good books out there. I wouldn't say that. I'm a bookworm myself. There are some really good commentaries. But the problem with commentaries also is if you just read commentaries, I, defy, I, I, I challenge you. Take three commentaries and read the same breakdown of the same passage in three commentaries. You'll get three different opinions because that's the way commentaries work. It is a commentary on the Bible. Have I used commentaries in the past? Yes. I don't use them as much as I used to because I want to learn directly from God. I want to hear directly from God. That doesn't mean that commentaries are useless. They're not. It doesn't mean there are some good Christian books out there. I'm sure there are. There's some good, solid Bible teachers out there. There's not many, but there's a few. There's a few that, that I particularly like, that I am ministered to, that I think are solid solid teachers of the word uh two of them i'll mention i'll just mention alistair Begg, charles stanley two of my favorites is a 
is a secular word, but they are two men that I've learned a lot from and I respect and they have a solid grasp of the word. They're people that I listen to, but then I, I, I listen to a lot of scholarly stuff because I need to be challenged. So I, I listen to a lot of obscure stuff that if I told you, it would probably just wreck your head. It'd be like, wait, man, that's too much. You know, say that for seminary. But my point is this. Here's the, la here's the last point I want to make because I'm running a little long and I don't want to take hours and hours like some of these broadcasts do. I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people stay viewing for hours. Uh, I don't get it. Let me be completely and totally honest with you, okay? I made some strong statements tonight, um, but there's one more I'm going to make before I sign off here. Part of the problem that I see, because the Bible is self-contained, and because God does and don't take away from the words, the minute you do that, you're in violation of God's law. You're in violation of his command not to do that. And I pointed out tonight very quickly in the Old Testament and New Testament, it says the same thing. Don't add, don't take away. So we can't just say, oh, it's just a particular book of the Bible he's talking about. That's a cop-out. That is not true. That's not the way it works. But one of the things that, that really troubles me, and I, I can't reconcile it because there's no biblical validation for this. All of a sudden, there is this proliferation of apostles. Okay? I said that earlier. Apostles and bishops and prophetesses. Now, I am not questioning anyone at all. If you're called to ministry and that's what God has called you to do, then God bless you. Preach the truth. But here's what bothers me. Everyone seems to have a word. Everybody seems to have a some sort of a prophetic word. Well, I've got a word for you. God has a word for you. And the problem that I have with that is this. You can listen to all these so-called prophets, and their words don't even match up. You would think that if God is giving prophetic, prophecy he's giving prophetic words to his people that there would be a consistent theme the same way you see in the bible that god would be dealing with his prophets all the same way but what i see and what i hear is prophet a over here says this and then prophet b comes along and says that and prophet c comes along and says that so where is truth if god indeed is still bringing prophetic revelation and i do not believe he is because he clearly said in his book don't add to it and don't take away. If you have someone that says, God spoke to me, God gave me a word, God, I hear from the voice of God, my opinion, based on scripture, they're a false prophet because they can say whatever they want. If you preach from the word of God only and you quote what God says and you preach what God says, it's a completely different matter than if you're just pulling things out of the sky and say, God's speaking to me, and this is what he said. You know, uh, if you if you do this, God will do that for you. If you if you you know bless this ministry, this will happen to you. Sow a seed, and this will happen to you. Where, where's all? No. So if God is indeed talking to all of these so these prophets and these apostles, if he's really talking to all of them, why is there not a consistent 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 message between all of them i can't tell you and this is just something that i do personally i cannot tell you how many false prophets i have to block on social media almost every day i'm blocking someone that has saying something ridiculous that has nothing to do with the bible or they're just spouting off suddenly everyone is a prophet suddenly everyone has a word from god well guess what we have a word from god it's called the bible but do we spend time in the actual word or are we, are we too busy listening to the latest prophet of the month that suddenly has this great revelation that came from God? That if you sow a seed or if you do this, then God will do this. God is not a puppet. God does not get controlled by us. We serve God. He doesn't serve us. And when I hear people saying, well, if you do this, then you know, just call it into existence and speak it into being. No. God spoke things into being in Genesis chapter 1. I couldn't speak anything into being no matter how hard I tried, and neither can you. And when you hear stuff like that, 
Go to the Bible and see if it's really true. Look up the verses and the passages that they're quoting and listen to their messages. And after a while, you will start to recognize common denominators between all these false prophets and all these false teachers. You will recognize, you will recognize them. You will know them by their fruit, Jesus said. You will know them. False prophets and false Christ will arise if it, it was possible to deceive even the very elect, those true believers, those who are truly born again, even if it was possible to deceive them. And once you have knowledge, once you understand scripture, once you understand the Bible, and you understand what some of these people are doing, you will want nothing to do with them. And as fast as they pop up, they get blocked. Now you may be thinking, now wait a minute, you know, you're you're a pastor and you're a preacher and you're a Christian man. I mean, is that a right to block people and and just get rid of them just like that? I mean, aren't you supposed to be loving towards them and compassionate towards them? I didn't say I didn't have compassion towards them. I didn't say that I didn't care about their souls. But what I will not have on my timeline is a lot of stuff that's spewed that's not biblical that is wrong. So anyone who's watching my timeline is going to be exposed to this nonsense. That I will not have. Will I pray for them? Sure. May I, may I even encourage them? Could I get into a debate with some of them maybe if it was done respectfully? Sure, I would do that. What I will not have is a lot of nonsense spewed that comes up on Facebook or comes up on Periscope or Twitter or wherever, and suddenly you've got uh, the prophet of the month suddenly spewing the latest thing. That's not happening. Now, if I offended anyone with this message, and I know I'm running long, if I've offended anyone with this message, it wasn't done with malice of forethought. It wasn't done with hatred in my soul. It was done because I care. It's done because maybe I'm one of the few pastors or preachers out here that's willing to say exactly how it is and tell you what it is. I'm not afraid to tell you what it is. I'm not afraid to tell you what the Bible says because I'm commanded to tell you what the Bible says. If I'm not your type of preacher or pastor, I get it. I'm not for everyone. Matter of fact, I'm for very few, I'm for very few. And that's okay. I want to thank you for being part of this message. I hope it helped you. I hope at the very minimum, it gave you some things to think about. It gave you some things to think about. I gave you plenty of scripture references that you could go and study for the next week and dig into all of this and see if even what I said is the truth and see if it makes sense to you. But my, my, my thing is this, the Bible is enough and it should be enough. Genesis to Revelation is more than enough for us to study for an entire life to hear what God has to say, not what the latest prophet of the month has to say, or the latest revelation, or the latest scheme that comes along to get your money so that they can promise you some kind of seed that's never going to grow, or whatever the latest con is. I mean, it's out there. It's out there. I see it all the time. Guaranteed, you've seen it before. Uh, listen, and I can speak with authority too. You know why? Because there were a number of years I got caught up in these cults. I got caught up in faith healing. And I'll tell you, if there really truly is a faith healer around, why are there still people in hospitals? If there really is a faith healer that can actually heal, and I don't believe there is, if there actually is a faith healer that can heal, why do you not hear them getting people out of wheelchairs and in the hospitals? I'm not talking about the phony miracles you see at Crusades. One thing you'll notice, here's, here's something. If you ever watch these uh, these faith healers, okay, they actually are a riot. But I got caught up with this mess years ago, and I actually started believing that these people really had a special gift until I found out it's all a game, it's all a con. What you will never see, ever, you will never see, and check me out on this, what, here's what you will never see. You will never see a faith healer actually do the miracles that Jesus did. Are you hearing me? You will never see them. Oh, you may see somebody come up out of a wheelchair. But the, the fact of the matter is they could walk to begin with. You may see them supposedly uh, heal someone who's deaf or someone who's blind. But the fact of the matter is they were legally blind, not totally blind. They could still see. And they weren't totally deaf, maybe just in one ear. But they weren't healed. Here's what you won't see. You will never see on the television somebody that has a withered hand. Where are we at in the camera here? Somebody has a withered hand, and you tell them, you know, open your hand, and it just opens up. That's what Jesus did. You will never see someone go to a dead body and say, rise up or come out of the grave like Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth after four days in the grave, and he comes out, and he's alive. You will never see that. You will never see these kind of miracles. You won't see it because these people can't do it. 
but it's been going on for decades. These people are charlatans. These people are frauds. No one can heal like that. God can heal. But when you see this, these dog and pony shows going on, my oh my, this guy can heal and that woman can heal and boy, aren't they touching, aren't they anointed. You check out some of their so-called miracles and you see if it stacks up with the miracles that Jesus did in the Bible. And I guarantee you, you will never see one. Just can't happen. You can't see it. They can't do it. It's impossible. So let me leave it there because this, this could go on for three hours. And I promised I wasn't going to do that. Hey, if this message has helped you, if this has helped you in any way, please feel free to share it. Isaiah 55, 11 says what? The word of God doesn't return void. If I preach the word of God tonight, if I preach truth tonight, somebody heard it. Somebody was blessed by it. Someone was convicted. Please, you go ahead and you share it with someone else because somebody else needs to hear this. This is a warning, okay? This is a clarion call. This is a warning. The Bible is enough. The Bible is enough. Let's spend our time in the Bible discovering what God says and not what every prophet of the month says. Not the latest apostle to come along with some great revelation. Okay? Let's not do that. Let's find out what God said through his real prophets, through the real apostles. There was only 12. One was a, a, a traitor, but there was only 12 in the beginning. There's not hundreds or thousands of them. Impossible. So let me leave it there. Would you play, pray for the ministry, please? Livinginharmonyministries.org. You've heard it all the time. As you see, we don't hold back here. I don't hold back. And those of you who've been watching me uh, Sundays, I've been preaching from Grace Community Church in Lombard, and I don't hold back there either. That's just who I am. It's just who God made me to be. Can't hold back. Uh, another two weeks, I'll be preaching at another church, another local church that's giving me an opportunity to preach, and I'm looking forward to it. So please keep our ministry in prayer. If you want to support us, that's between you and the Lord. You can do it through our website or right through Facebook Messenger. I don't harp on that. That's, uh, that's between you and God. But I want to thank you for bearing with me here. It looks like we're going on 42 minutes, a little longer than my normal one, but I just I had to get this out today or I wasn't going to be able to sleep tonight. So thank you for being with me and God bless you.